Why did Austria and Prussia go to war against each other? Relations between Austria and Prussia, cool, before 1862, became much cooler after Bismarck's appointment. In December 1862, he warned Austria that it was inviting catastrophe unless it recognized Prussia as an equal in Germany. It should be said that in 1862-63, to 63, the prospect of Bismarck defeating Austria and bringing about a Prussian-dominated Germany was highly unlikely. Bismarck's own position in Germany seemed similarly vulnerable. Its territory straddled across Central Europe. Austria had a population almost twice that of Prussia and had a larger army. Most German states had no wish to be dominated by Prussia. In the late 18th century, Russia, Prussia, and Austria had divided Poland between them. Relations between Prussia and her Polish citizens had been uneasy, and Poles had been blamed without much evidence for some of the disturbances of 1848. Bismarck thought they were troublemakers. In 1863, when the inhabitants of Russian Poland rose in revolt, Bismarck viewed the situation with concern. The revolt might escalate into a general Polish uprising. Tsar Alexander II ordered the revolt to be suppressed. France, Austria, and Britain protested and offered mediation. Bismarck took the opportunity to gain Russian friendship by offering military assistance. The Tsar, confident he could defeat the Poles unaided, rejected the offer, but he agreed to a convention by which Prussia would hand over to the Russians any Polish rebels who crossed the border. Prussian liberals who hated autocratic Russia protested at Bismarck's action. So too did France, Britain, and Austria. Bismarck found himself isolated. In an attempt to improve his diplomatic position, he claimed that the convention did not exist because it had never been ratified. This angered the Tsar and Prussia was left completely friendless. The Polish uprising was finally suppressed in 1864. Prussia emerged from the affair less disastrously than Bismarck expected. Given that the Tsar had been deeply offended by Austrian and French criticism, it was likely that Russia would remain neutral in the event of Prussia going to war with Austria or France. In November 1863, the childless King Frederick VII of Denmark died. Frederick had also been the ruler of the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein that had been under Danish rule for 400 years. The population of Schleswig was mixed Danish and German, while that of Holstein was almost entirely German. Holstein was a member of the German Confederation. Schleswig was not. There had often been trouble over the duchies. In 1848, the Holsteiners had rebelled against Denmark and Prussian troops had marched to their aid with the support of the Frankfurt Parliament until Russia intervention had forced the Prussian army into retreat. A treaty signed in London by the great powers in 1852 had agreed that Frederick would be succeeded as ruler of Denmark and the duchies by Christian of Glucksburg, who was heir to the Danish throne through marriage to the king's first cousin. Schleswig and Holstein contested his claims on the grounds that inheritance through the female line was forbidden in the duchies. Schleswig and Holsteiners put forward their own claimant, the Prince of Augustenburg. He, however, did not object to being passed over in the treaty, having been well paid to agree, although he never formally renounced his rights. When Christian became King of Denmark in November 1863, government officials in Holstein refused to swear allegiance to him, and the son of the Prince of Augustenburg now claimed both duchies on the grounds that his father had not signed away his rights to them. This move was passionately supported by German nationalists. 
King Christian immediately put himself in the wrong by incorporating Schleswig into Denmark, therefore violating the 1852 Treaty of London. In December 1863, the smaller states of the German Confederation, condemning Christian's actions as tyrannical, sent an army into Holstein on behalf of the Duke of Augustenburg, the Prince of Augustenburg's son. The Duke became the most popular figure in Germany, a symbol of nationalism, uniting both liberals and conservatives. Bismarck was not influenced by German public opinion. However, he did see that the crisis offered splendid opportunities. He hoped to annex the two duchies, strengthening Prussian power in North Germany and winning credit for himself into the bargain. He had no wish to see the Duke of Augustenburg in control of another independent state in North Germany, nor did he care at all about the rights of the Germans within the duchies. It is not a concern of ours, he said privately, whether the Germans of Holstein are happy. Bismarck first won Austrian help. Austrian ministers had very different aims from Bismarck. Austria, while supporting the Augustenburg claim, was suspicious of rampant German nationalism, anxious to prevent Bismarck from allying Prussia with the forces of nationalism, Austria was happy to pursue what appeared to be a traditional policy of cooperating with Prussia. Bismarck, implying that he too supported Augustenburg, kept secret his own expansionist agenda. Agreeing to an alliance, Austria and Prussia now issued an ultimatum to Denmark, threatening to occupy Schleswig unless it withdrew the new constitution within 48 hours. Denmark refused. Thus, in January 1864, a combined Prussian and Austrian army advanced through Holstein and Schleswig. Denmark, failing to win the support of Britain, France, or Russia, agreed that the Schleswig-Holstein matter should be resolved by a European conference. However, the London Conference of April and June 1864 failed to reach agreement. Counting on Britain's support, Denmark refused to make concessions and fighting recommenced. Despite British Prime Minister Palmerston's boast that if Denmark had to fight, she would not fight alone, there was little Britain could actually do. Denmark thus had little choice but to surrender in July 1864. By the Treaty of Vienna in October 1864, the King of Den Denmark gave up his rights over Schleswig and Holstein, which were to be jointly administered by Austria and Prussia. As Bismarck probably intended, the question of long-term fate of the duchies now became a source of severe tension between the two German powers. Public opinion in Germany and the duchies expected that Augustenburg would become Duke. However, Bismarck proposed that he be installed on conditions that he had would have left him under Prussia's power. This was totally unacceptable to Austria and to the Duke, who refused to become a Prussian puppet. Austria turned to the Diet, a motion calling for the recognition of the Duke of Augustenburg easily passed, but Prussia ensured nothing was done. Thus, by the summer of 1865, the future of the duchies was still not settled, and relations between Austria and Prussia were poor. Austria continued to support Augustenburg's claim, while Prussia worked for annexation. In truth, neither Austria nor Bismarck wanted war at this stage. Austria, almost financially bankrupt, regarded war as too expensive a luxury. Bismarck was aware that Wilhelm I was reluctant to fight a fellow German state, nor was he convinced that the Prussian army was yet ready to fight and win. While Bismarck and Wilhelm I were testing the waters at a fashionable Austrian spa town of Bad Gastein, an Austrian envoy arrived to open negotiations. As a result of this meeting, it was agreed in August 1865 by the Convention of Gastein that 
Holstein, the duchy, the duchy nearer to Prussia, would be administered by Austria, and Schleswig would be administered by Prussia. The two powers would retain joint sovereignty over both duchies. Bismarck knew he could now pick a quarrel with Austria over Holstein at any time he wanted. Bismarck's motives in dealing with the Schleswig-Holstein affair remain a subject of debate. Had he used the duchies, as he later claimed, as a means of maneuvering Austria into open confrontation with Prussia? Or did he, whatever he said later, have no clear policy at the time except for to allow events to ripen? Historian A.G.B. Taylor thought that he may well have hoped to maneuver Austria out of the duchies, perhaps even out of the headship of Germany, by diplomatic strokes. His diplomacy in this period seems rather calculated to frighten Austria than to prepare for war. The particular problem of the duchies temporarily was solved, but the more general problem of rivalry between Prussia and Austria remained. While Bismarck may not have wanted war at this stage, he realized that it was a distinct possibility. He therefore did all he could to strengthen Prussia's international position. Confident that Britain and Russia would not support Austria, his main fear was France. In October 1865, Bismarck met the French Emperor Napoleon III at Biarritz in the south of France. Historians continued to debate what occurred. Almost certainly nothing specific was agreed, if only because neither man wanted a specific agreement. Bismarck was not prepared to offer German territory in the Rhineland in return for France's neutrality. Napoleon, calculating that a war between the two German powers would be exhausting and inconclusive, intended to remain neutral and then to turn this advantage by mediating between the two combatants, gaining a much greater reward in the process than anything Bismarck could presently offer. Giving Napoleon's anti-Austrian stance, it took little skill on Bismarck's part to secure the emperor's good wishes. Over the winter of 1865 to 1866, Prussia and Austrian relations deteriorated. Austria now determined on a policy of confrontation with Prussia. It did so from a weak position. It had no allies. It was on the verge of bankruptcy, and Holstein was sandwiched between Prussian territory. In February 1866, at a meeting with the Prussian Crown Council, Bismarck declared that war with Austria was only a matter of time. It would be fought not just to settle the final fate of the duchies, but over the wider issue of who should control Germany. Bismarck carefully laid the groundwork for war. A secret alliance was made with Italy in April 1866, by which Italy agreed to follow Prussia if it declared war on Austria within three months. In return, Italy would acquire Venetia from Austria when the war ended. Immediately after the treaty with Italy had been signed, Bismarck stoked up tension with Austria over Holstein and over proposals to reform the Confederation. Bismarck knew that these proposals, which included setting up a representative assembly elected by universal manhood suffrage, would be unacceptable to Austria. The Austrians, afraid of a surprise attack, were forced to take what appeared to be an aggressive step of mobilizing unilaterally in April 1866. Prussia mobilized in May, seemingly as a response to Austrian threats. Britain, France, and Russia proposed the Congress to discuss the situation. Bismarck felt compelled to agree to do otherwise would put him in a weak position, but he was very relieved when Austria refused, making the Congress unworkable. The situation deteriorated further when, in early June, Austria broke off talks with Prussia and, in breach of previous promises, referred the problem of the duchies to the Diet. Bismarck's response was to send a Prussian army in to Austrian-controlled Holstein on June 9th. 
Austrian troops were permitted to withdraw peacefully. To Bismarck's surprise and disappointment, this did not immediately lead to war. To stir things up, he presented to the Diet an extended version of his proposals for a reform of the federal constitution. In it, Austria was to be excluded from the Confederation. There should be a national parliament elected by universal suffrage, and all troops in North Germany should be under Prussian command. The next day, Austria asked the Diet to reject Prussia's proposals and to mobilize for war. Censured by the Diet, the Prussians withdrew from the Confederation, declared it dissolved, and invited all the other German states to ally themselves with against Austria. However, most began mobilizing against Prussia. Bismarck now issued an ultimatum to three northern states, Hanover, Hesse-Kassel, and Saxony, to side with Prussia or else to be regarded as enemies. When the ultimatums were rejected, Prussian troops invaded the three states on June 15th. Hesse-Kassel and Saxony offered no resistance. Hanoverian forces were quickly defeated. The future of Bismarck, Prussia, and Germany lay with the Prussian army. Since the shambles of 1859, reforms had been successfully carried out, and the army was now under the command of General Moltke, a gifted military leader. Advanced planning and preparation, particularly in the use of railways for moving troops, meant that mobilization was much more efficient than that of the Austrian army. Austria's position was far from hopeless. It had more soldiers, 400,000 to the Prussians, 300,000. Most of the other German states supported Austria. Austria had the advantage of a central position, and initially many Prussians were lukewarm about the war. However, the Italians fulfilled their part of the secret treaty by following Prussia into the war. This meant that Austria was forced to fight on two fronts, in the north against Prussia and in the south against Italy. The Italian army, weak and inefficient, was defeated by the Austrians on June 24th. To prevent the victorious Austrians in the south from linking up with their troops in the north, Moltke determined to invade Bohemia. One single track railway ran from Vienna to Bohemia. By contrast, Prussia used five lines to bring in troops southwards. Moltke adopted the risky strategy of dividing his forces for faster movement, only concentrating them on the eve of battle. Fortunately for Prussia, the Austrian high command missed several opportunities to annihilate the separate Prussian armies. On the 3rd of July, 1866, the major battle of the war was fought at Sodoa. Nearly half a million men were involved, with the two sides almost equally balanced. The Austrians were well equipped with artillery and used it effectively at the start of the battle, but they were soon caught in a Prussian pincer movement. The Prussians brought into use their new breech-loading needle gun. Its rate of fire was five times greater than anything the Austrians possessed, and it proved decisive. The Austrian army fled in disorders. Austria suffered 45,000 casualties, Prussia 9,000. The Prussians had won the battle, and with it, the war. The Austrian government recognized that further fighting would almost certainly lead to further defeats and might even result in the breakup of the Austrian Empire. For Austria, the priority was a rapid end to the fighting at any reasonable cost. Prussia was now in a position to dictate terms as the victor. It was a personal victory for Bismarck and put him in a position to dominate not only Prussia, but also the whole of Germany for the next quarter of a century.